All right, we are live. Go Pokes. How you doing? Ryan here with you. Of course, we have our special guest, Mr. Jim Gazzolo. He's the host of Poke Nation on CBS Lake Charles. He's a freelance sports writer for the Lake Charles American Press, and he's also a radio host for 104.1 The Game. I introduce to you, Jim, the triple threat, Gazzolo. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I don't Jim, know about that. Thank you so much for your time, man. I, I sure do appreciate it. Appreciate no you. It's awesome to have a McNeese insider here. Uh, also, just like it says below, we're going to have a QA and a with Jim at the end of the show. So comment your questions now. All right. Ready when you are. I, I guess when I have three things, it means I can't get a job at any one of them. <laughs> that, that? That, no, that means everybody's wanting you, Jim. <laughs> I don't know in the that. resume. <sighs> All right. Let's start talking about, obviously, we're two days into fall camp. The buzz is all around Lake Charles. We have a new coach, Gary Goff, comes in with a great resume of turning teams around. He knows how to win. What is the vibe of fall camp right now? It's it's positive, which is the first thing I could say <laughs> is a difference to begin with. I think the difference is energy and a buzz within the town and a buzz about what could be. Uh, I, I think there's, you know, we've been through so much, I think, the fresh start is just a, a hopeful and uh, 110 guys, 58 of them new um, shows that uh, there's still interest in Lake Charles and McNeese state. Wow. Yeah. You know, the last six years we've had to deal with two coordinators and a position coach playing head coach. It's finally nice to have an actual head coach. Well, that's uh, as I've said before with, with Gary Goff is the difference with this to me is, this is the first time since Matt Viator where the man in the building wants to be in the building. In other words, he didn't come here, and the first thing he was doing is looking for his next job. Sure, I think he wants to move up. I think he's coming up the ladder, but he's not hes not settling for McNeese and looking to move on. He wants to build this thing back up so that's on his resume so he can take that to the next step. Yeah, and I heard you on the game, say, uh, game today saying it's a five-year contract, so that's awesome. So it's a three it's a three year deal with two year options. Um, so each side has something to work on, but it's also the richest in the history of McNeese football, which means that there is now a commitment to that. You know, Matt Viator won all these championships. He was the lowest paid uh, coach in the Southland. Um, now we're at least in line with everybody else. There's some bonuses that will get him, and and he could have a nice. It's, it's a nice payday if he gets all his bonuses. Yeah, and the guy that brought him over here. A.D. Heath Schroyer, what can you say about this guy? I mean, obviously, to me, he's shown that he's one of the most important hires that Magnus has made in a while. This guy is getting us ready for the future. Well, he, he's uh, – I don't like to say too much because on the show, his head just kind of swells as I talk. <laughs> uh, but he's Mr. Media. He's everywhere. He sells the program. And that that's what he has been become. He is McNeese's pitch man, not only for current things, but for the future. And he's really about rebranding McNeese. And also, he's really about taking it to the next step. And obviously, the next step is, is FBS. But he believes that, uh, and he truly believes that the next five years are the greatest five years of McNeese history. He'll tell you that if you ever talk to him a hundred times, and you'll get sick of it. But that's what he believes. Yeah, and then when you interviewed him on the game, you credit him with saving the Southland Conference as well. Oh, he saved this conference. I can tell you this. I know for a fact that had McNeese left the conference in, uh, I guess it was October, um, and it was within an hour, hour and a half. An hour and a half, between an hour and a half from when he signed to stay in the conference, McNeese was headed to the WAC. He was going to dinner to have it in Dallas for the WAC. McNeese was going to the WAC. Incarnate Word would have gone to the WAC. And that next morning, um, Southeastern and Nichols were going to have conversations with the Atlantic Sun and the Southland would have been down to three teams. So wow. the Southland would no longer have existed. So he saved it, and then he got Lamar to come back, him and him and Chris Grant. He got him a lot of credit to Chris Grant, uh, the commissioner, and he got Incarnate Word to flip at the last minute and stay. So now you've got two Division One schools that wanted to come back. McNeese has always – or um, the Southland has always been known for kind of picking the low-hanging fruit from Division Two and, and, and saying, come join us. You've now got them. I think Stephen F. Austin is at least kicking the tires on coming back, and I know Central Arkansas has talked about it. So you yeah. have a place where you have a place where people want to go. 
precisely. I would love to see West Florida come over, and I know they were kicking the tires on that a while back. Is that ever going to be a possibility? Uh, I think that if in some form of expansion, the West Florida thing, you know, interestingly about West Florida, that that head coach who came over here and beat us opening weekend last year uh, was actually the, one of the finalists for the job. Wow. And uh, Gary Goff beat him twice last year. <laughs> uh, but – uh, I, I think that West Florida, interestingly enough, is it has to hop two states. And the question then becomes, one, do they want to go to Division One, And two, their facilities are really good. So they could make the jump. But the question is, do they want to make the jump? Because now you're competing with Florida State for talent. You're competing with – that's a bigger state to deal with. Um, but, yeah, I, I think they're an, they're an obvious good look. If Tarleton, I think Tarleton becomes a good look. Um, I think Tarleton, who comes here next year to open the season, probably would have come, would have stayed or have gone to the Southland had McNeese not said they were going to the WAC. But Tarleton also really wants to go to FBS as well. Now, before we get off of Heath Schroyer, yes, obviously the, the coach golf hire is exceptional. Another exceptional hire that puts his fingerprint on Magnese is Coach Lynn Kennedy. Yes. What this guy did with the women's team and how exciting it is going into the next season to see what they can do, they're going to be a problem next year. They, they are year. Uh, They are going to be a, a powerhouse with him. And I, and I say that in this much. If you've ever watched a Lynn Kennedy practice, it is constant movement, and it is a lot like a Gary Goff practice. In other words, I, I, I like to say, and, and I hate to pick on previous coaching staffs and that, there was coaching going on, but there was not a lot of it. It was like, okay, we went to practice. You know, Braden Adams, a, a kid from Barb, said it best yesterday. He said, we want to be here now. That's the Lynn Kennedy thing. He makes the girls want to be there, want to compete, want to play hard. And – I think when when you can steal a guy, and I say steal a guy, uh, to come from Portland State for essentially less money and build a program here without a gym, because when he was selling it, it wasn't a gym, uh, you can sell just about anything to anybody. <laughs> yeah. Because four years ago, the McNeese Athletic Program was maybe one of the worst in Division One. It had no direction. It had little leadership, it had little money, and its facilities were just destroyed by a hurricane. So in the last four years, they've gone from that to what you're looking at now is 110 kids in in football. Uh, um, the most, in my opinion, the most talent on this campus on all sports, uh, at least since I've been here, a powerhouse in softball, a very good baseball program, uh, and a football team that is, like I said, 110 kids. He sold 58 newcomers to come to a program that had two losing seasons, no lights, and no press box. That's some sales work. Impressive. Yeah, that, that's that to me is the most astonishing thing of all. And Schwer, you know, Schwer got his first recruiting class when there wasn't a gym. That gym's had to be repaired twi- or rebuilt twice. So that, right. that those are some amazing things that have happened. I know we better enjoy uh, Lane Kennedy while we can. I know he's under a multi-year deal, but after this season, I'm pretty sure some big universities are going to be knocking at his door. I I think a, a couple of things about the coaches that they have now. I don't think they're going to jump for the next job. That's I good think, to hear. I, I think um, especially Gary Goff, his kids are just starting high school. His son is just starting high school, I think, at Barb. And – there, there's there's some commitment to family that oh, I think they'll leave if they get a great offer. But I don't think uh, – I think they're more like a Billy Napier from ULL that waited two years for the right offer. I think he's going to wait for the right offer. And I think he, he thinks he's going to win a national championship here. He thinks he's going to be competing for one, that's for sure. Well, we talked about fall camp a second ago. Let's talk about the possible QB battle we got brewing. No. And we had a uh, comment, what does the QB room look like with Ogeron gone? Better. <laughs> not because not because of Cody, but there's just look. I, I'd like to say this, and I Cody Ojong, and I wrote this last year, was the most important person in the history of McNeese football for this reason. 
he stayed. Mm. Everybody else left. When they did senior night, or senior day, because it was at noon, he was the only guy that was there before with Lance Gidry. He stayed through all of it. And he gave them some stability. And he got the snappy out of himself with bad offensive lines. They were running offensive lines that had, uh, I hate to say this, but they had walk-on true freshmen who had never been in a college weight room because of COVID playing two sports seasons in one year in the fall. They were just dead, tired. They were overmatched by most fourth quarters. So uh, that's not to say Cody Ogeron was, but he's a 5'11 guy with limited talent, a big heart, and they didn't have anybody else in the room to push him. So the room itself now comes back with three FBS transfer guys and a freshman that looks as good as anybody. He's just not thick and experienced yet. So uh, it, it's a lot better room right now, a lot more competitive room. Right. We got Knox Kadem, who came from Knox Virginia Kadem. Tech. Yes. We got Cam Ransom, who came from Georgia Southern, yes. and Walker Wood from Kentucky. Yeah. Now, uh, and don't, was... forget, don't sleep on the McAllister kid. Uh, he's a freshman, but he's going to be good in a few years. Not now, keeping them through the transfer portal, oh, that's a different story. <laughs> now, I heard that Knox Kadem has a hand injury, and from your show today, Rick Saro – Said something about it happened in a plane. Yes, uh, I can. I can say I did write that. And yes, it. Uh, he was helping somebody with their baggage above the, and he basically uh, tore something in his thumb, very similar to the Drew Brees injury. Um, and uh, he is not. He threw yesterday and today, uh, but he had not thrown for most of the summer, so he's a little behind. They don't think it will affect the race for starting quarterback, um, but we'll see. And those two guys are two completely different quarterbacks. I, I love Walker Wood, but I think if Walker Wood starts, uh, I would think that would be a disappointment. I think this is I don't I think if Can Ramsom doesn't start, I think it'll be a disappointment. Yeah, if you haven't seen Knox Kadem or Cam Ramsom play, go check out some of their highlights on YouTube. I mean yeah. they both can run, they both can throw dimes, they both have cannons. I mean it's going to be epic whoever starts for quarterback for McNeese this year. Yeah, and they both, you know, like I say, they both look the part. They both have a presence. You could see it in, in uh, practice in their in their huddles. You can see they have some control. Now they got a lot to learn with the Gary Goff air raid, air raid offense. But I, I think that that's the biggest thing for this football team is if, you know, we never had to really experience what would happen if Cody Ogeron went down. But I, I had no confidence in whatever they were going to do. <laughs> um, there's 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 just more talent in the room. Yeah, there's more we, talent all over the field. And speaking of talent, we had a uh, preseason MVP vote on the group, and our offensive preseason MVP uh, voted by our fans was Mason Pierce. Do you expect him to have a breakout year this year? He could have a huge year because he's not. He may not be the fastest guy on the team. Oh wow! The the. Uh, and I, I, I forget his name completely. The guy from San Diego State can fly. Uh, they want. I don't want to have him have the race because somebody will pull a hamstring. But <laughs> uh, I think the offense will open up enough to where Mason Pierce can be really, really good and really, really important. There are far more weapons on the outside on this football team than we've ever seen here. That's fantastic. Far more. Uh, they can run. Um, there are unlimited amounts of ability as far as spreading the offense. Now they still, you know, they got to come up with a tight end situation and they have to figure out the running backs, Uh, but they have a couple options at running back. So this is a, this is a team that has more weapons than before on offense. The question is still going to be the offensive line. Yeah. How's the kid from Harvard looking at tight end? Well, it's early. Um, (laughs) I like, I like to say this. I, I actually like the kid from Monroe. Uh, but I think that there's they're looking at somebody. I think you'll see multiple tight ends play. I think they'll they'll play based on uh, the formations of what they're going to do. The thing I like about Goff that he said, which, which was really interesting yesterday, because I asked him about the quarterback competition. I said, "Does he? Because we we've had we've been trying to for for four years now. We've been trying to put this round uh, peg in a square hole." just forcing and forcing and forcing an offense that doesn't work with the quarterback we had. In this case, he said, 
I will I will adjust my offense to who is my quarterback. Mm. I'm not going to ask him to do. I'm not going to ask Knox to be Can. I'm not going to ask Can to be Knox. I'm going to do what is right for that quarterback and make him successful. And that's refreshing. Yeah. And <laughs> and speaking of quarterback, do you think that Coach Goff and Ad Schroyer thought we were going to get more transfers from Valdosta State? Their quarterbacks, some of their running backs, possibly. They were just fantastic. I, I think a lot of people thought maybe the quarterback, um, but he's in his last year, and he lost a national championship, and he wants to win a national championship, and not all the pieces fit. And um, I'm not – just because they won at Division Two. I'm not sure with the transfer portal that they didn't get better by bringing some people down from FBS talent-wise. Yeah. Now, the question is, how do they fit in here? Uh, and he has, he has talked openly about how they vetted kids differently this year than in past years. So the kids that wanted to be here were here, and they understood the, the level they were at. Uh, but if you saw practice, uh, there's an accountability with between players that was for the first time I saw. And there was this Hey, we don't we don't want to lose mentality. We're sick of losing mentality, and I, that's again. I, I use the word refreshing. It, it's a different vibe, but it's also a different look. Make sure you comment down below. We're going to have a Q and A with Jim at the end of the show. Now, speaking of weapons, our kicking game has been abysmal the last well, two seasons, or maybe being, even longer. You're being polite. <laughs> uh. Garrison, uh, Garrison Smith, transfer from Ohio State. There was a picture on McNeese football Facebook page the other day of him nailing a field goal. How's this kid looking? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't like McNeese doing all that social media because those are those are my stories. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> a part. Um, I don't know what's going on with my Siri here. Uh, um, I, you, you'll find out that I'm not technologically very good. Uh, <laughs> the thing about it is, and I hate I hate to bring up the past, but last year uh, during they they have a little at the end of the first quarter they have, they would have a girl from the from somewhere come out and kick an extra point, and at one point she was three for three of they were three of seven, <laughs> and our. Wow kicker was our kickers were two of eight <laughs> so i said well i just hired her i just give her a scholarship <laughs> i was pulling my hair out man the oh. the wild thing is and i went back and i looked they lost they went seven and eleven and three and four they lost 11 of 18 games i think uh in the two seasons last spring and fall of that Seven of those 11 losses were, while they weren't completely on the kicking game, they were influenced by the kicking game. In other words, we'd miss an extra point, and be, instead of being down one score, you're still down two. You're still down eight. Or we'd miss a field goal that would keep would have cut it to two, and now we need a field goal to win it. And then there were times when we, they actually cost a game like West Florida and some others. Um so it wasn't like they were blown out of every game, but the kicking game was horrible. It was the worst kicking game I've seen. And, and the kicking game was so poorly handled by the coaching staff. And I say that in this. If you missed a kick, you weren't kicking again that game. So where was the confidence level in that room? Yeah. So I say it was not only poorly done, it was also mishandled. Um, you know, the, the starting kicker makes the first extra point, misses the next then doesn't kick the the rest of the opener. What what message are we sending? Yeah. So that that Garrison Smith will be a good kicker. <laughs> His 35 yard field goals in practice today looked like they would have been good from 50 and they were right down the middle. Yes. It will not be where it, you will not an extra point will not be an adventure. Because if you think about the history of McNeese McNeese has been able to find some great kickers. Yes. It'd be nice to have another one. Uh, yes, and um, there is a reason for that. Uh, they used to allow 
the St. Louis kids and the St. Louis coaches uh, kind of an open workout on the field. And that ended, and I think their relationship kind of was, was costly. And I think we saw that because some of those kids went elsewhere. And you, that did just exactly what I commented a few years ago. I was like, why aren't the ki- the special teams coach camped out at St. Louis? Yes. <laughs> now I know. They, they had a, I don't want to say, and, and this goes back to this Gilbert year. They didn't have a falling out. They just had a, he was distant. And it was a, uh, yeah, yeah, if you want to go over there. It wasn't an embracing. Mm-hmm. And so they stopped. That's all. Uh, also, we got some key returning players on defense. We have our Go Pokes preseason defensive MVP voted on by our group members, Mason Kinsey, Cordell Williams, Joey McNeely, Accord Green. What are some of the, some of the new defensive players that are going to be coming in this year uh, that you got your eye on? Oh, your mic's out again. Is it? Can't hear you. Is it plugged into your computer? You can twist it around a little bit. I just said the computer mic. Oh, there we go. I can hear huh. you now. No, I don't know. Hold on, let me. Kim, can you come here? So, hold on, my technician will be coming. <laughs> My mic is out. Can you help me? I can, but I can hear myself. We will figure. Yeah, it kind of comes back and in. I don't know how to do that. Where'd my mic go? You're back on now. Not no, they can't, it, hear they can't hear me now. No, you're good now, Jim. I can hear you now. Now you can. Now you can. Yeah, we, you're back on now. Oh, okay. I have no idea what happened. In, it was kind of going in and out. All right, well, we'll just say it was. We'll, we'll blame it on the thunder and lightning. <laughs> there you How's go. That? Yeah, what okay. are some defensive players that you got your eye on this year? Well, I, I think uh, I think Kinsley's going to have a big year. Um, but I think there's some other guys uh, that I think Br- Braden Adams, I want to see, he had the best spring of anybody I thought at linebacker. Um, and I think, uh, I think the kid from Houston, I, f- I forget his name really quick. The names are still new to me. Remember? Um, uh, I think he's going to be big because he comes from the same Isaiah chambers. He's kind of following in Isaiah chambers, footsteps, but this whole quest is going to be on the four or five portal guys they brought in, in mass in the defensive secondary because remember who they lost. They lost Andre Sam. Uh, they lost Colby Richardson. All these guys that were going to come back and were all conference performers are now gone. So how that group plays is probably ultimately the, uh, the difference in this football team, I think. And it's not that they have to be completely great. They just have to stop big plays. Mm-hmm. Um, but those, those, that's the position I have my eye on the most on defense. It's also maybe the most important position because I think the offensive line is going to be pretty good. I think the offensive line behind Calvin Barkett is going to be really good because it got a lot, it got its first year in the weight room. And some of those kids that had to play last year got a lot of work under fire. And those are the guys I want to see. Because I think those guys have a chance to really do something as a group and take the biggest step. And if they do that and the defensive backfield does well, I, I think they have a chance to be a good football team. And I don't think anybody, you know, somebody asked me the other day who's going to win the Southland. And I said, not sure really who's still in the Southland. Uh, <laughs> but I think that with all the transfer portal stuff, if you saw, if Garrison Smith is the real thing, if Cam Ranson especially is the real thing, 
and all these weapons are there, this football team comes down to can they stop big plays? You're getting some love in the chat right now. Jay Money in the house. All right. <laughs> All right, so some of the names that I noticed weren't on this new roster that they posted yes. on McNeese. Cade Bartlett. Cade Bartlett Jake is LaFleur, gone. Yes. And Dante Hargrove. Uh, I was surprised a little bit by Jake. Uh, I was not surprised by Cade. Um, I kind of had a conversation with his dad in the spring, and I think he saw the writing on the wall as who was coming in. Um. I, I think uh, who's the third you mentioned? Hargrove. Dante Hargrove. Uh, they they brought in uh, McElroy from Colorado State, who I think is going to be the power back. Um, so I think the tight end situation kind of saw. Look, I'm gonna what I've understood in the it, what Gary Goff has told me is. If you don't want to be here, we're not going to make you be here. And I think we found out a lot of guys that didn't want to be here. Um, and I'm talking about guys that maybe were we thought more of them than was there, or really I don't want to I don't want to criticize kids in that, but weren't maybe totally committed to the program. Uh, didn't want to get up early in the morning and lift the weights. Didn't want to. There's a sea change in the culture of the program. And I'll just say this. If they're not here, there's a reason why they're not here. <laughs> yeah. How's that? There we go. <laughs> Enough said. Uh, um, if, if they were good enough and wanted to be here, they'd be here. Um, and that's why you got 58 newcomers. Yeah. So Another, Some more love in the chat. Got on late. Just want to say this is great. Thumbs up. Well, thumbs up back at you. <laughs> and, and then speaking of, you know, the, all those new kids, we got transfers. Oh, we got transfers. <laughs> I, you know, I did, the, other day, the other day I did a piece on the five transfers that I thought are the five newcomers that I thought would be the biggest. And I realized when I was doing it, I, I could have named four or five more. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a talent level of, I don't want to say it's it's a, a, a talent level that was missing, but it is a playmaker group. And when you add four, essentially three four receivers, because the kid from Utah is a uh, kind of a hybrid that will that will allow Pierce not to have to be returning every kick um, as a utility guy offensively. There are plays that can be set for almost three or four guys instead of last year. All we had for big play was Mason Pierce. Yeah. He is now an option in a room of options. So, you know, I, I know everybody was like, well, Cody this, Cody that. Cody didn't have many people to throw to. <laughs> That's why the tight end position on this team, because everybody says, well, he's going to do the air raid and he's going to air it out. He's gonna... He takes what the offense gives you or what the defense gives him. If the defense puts eight in the box, he'll throw. If they back off, he's going to run the football. And he's got some running backs that I think are, are – more than capable we've seen in the last year and a half. McMahon is one of them. And yeah. uh, uh, the kid, like I said, the kid from Colorado State, he is more of a power back. But they have they have options at, at uh, running back as power and speed. So I, I think the offense will struggle probably early, but I think the offense in general will be more exciting. And, and we had some bad – we've had four or five years of bad offense. Yeah, and then you add in to that, you know, quarterback runs because um, Ransom and Knox Kadem, I mean, they're not scared to hit people. They're going to run you over. No, and and they're and they're not afraid to do it. Yeah. In other words, they're not I, they're not going to be running for their lives. There will be plays where they will run, or they will have there will be option plays in there that will allow them the opportunity to make plays with their legs. He's looking for somebody that can throw the ball downfield, make plays with their legs, and make sound decisions within the framework of his office. So in other words, if he's got three or four options when he comes to the line of scrimmage, he wants the guy to get them in the right position. I saw in one of Cam Ramson's highlights from Georgia Southern, his running back was getting pulled down 
all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he jumps over his running back and grass backs a defensive back. Yes. Top and, of the day. I was standing up cheering. I will say this about him is he was he played nine games. He was considered and was still considered, even with the coaching change, to be the future of Georgia Southern. The fact is the guy that came came from USC, brought his senior quarterback with him. And Cam didn't want to stay. Had he had he stayed, he would have competed for the job. He has an absolute cannon for an arm. Mm -hmm. And it's an exciting opportunity to it is what McNeese people have been begging for. And I don't want to, I don't want to knock on Knox because Knox was really developed in the spring very well. But I think the hand injury is going to slow him down in camp to where it's going to be tough for him to – if you get enough of, of Cam Ransom, it's going to be hard to go away from him. Unless I'm just missing something. Another comment out there. Love the show. Long overdue. Appreciate it. Now, let's talk about the schedule. Okay. This may be just because I'm a homer, but I see at least nine wins on this schedule. Well, I think you're seeing it through rose-colored glasses. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> so we got Montana State. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some renegades. There's some big boys. That's a tough one. That's a yeah. tough one to start with. The number two team in the country. Yeah. So obviously anything can happen. Yeah, it's a but, tough one to start with. Yeah, the consensus is that probably is going to be a loss. That's a tough one to start. <laughs> yeah. I'll have my pick that week. But yeah, that's uh that's that's probably a loss. And then we got Rice. Yes, and that is the That's biggest a game. game. That is the biggest game of the year. Yes. For for multiple reasons. Um it is the to me that is the biggest game for this season because that is a game against an FC FBS opponent that is beatable. It is a game against a Conference USA opponent where you want to be at and it is an opportunity for the McNeese fans to travel and go two hours and show that they are a viable uh, entity when it comes to traveling financially for a conference to look at. That is a huge game in a lot of ways. Next games are against Alcorn and Mississippi College. Those are wins. I would hope so. Yes. If not, uh, we got problems. Uh, then we have Incarnate Word. Now we get into the unknown. Yes. Yeah, Incarnate Lindsay Word. Scott's there, so it's an iffy, but I I'm saying that's a win. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> then we have Texas a Commerce. That should be a win. I'm saying that's a win. Okay. Then we have Nichols. I'm saying that's a win. Mm, why? <laughs> I just feel it. That's the best returning quarterback in the conference, in my opinion, the best running back returning in the conference, and the best, I think, the best football coach in the conference right now. Because we'll I think it is. but... I think at this point in the schedule, we're going to have a lot of time to work the kinks out. Okay. We should be hitting all cylinders around the Nichols game. Then we okay. got Southeastern. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a, a big one. That's a toss up for me. I think it could possibly be a loss. I like that it's here, but yeah. Yes. And then, of course, I see us winning out the rest of the season Eastern Illinois, Houston Baptist, and Lamar. That Nine would probably be true. Uh, yeah, I think. A couple of games I disagree with you in there. Well, what do you what do you what are you doing at Rice? So you're saying we're beating Rice? I'm, I think we beat Rice. I think Rice okay. comes in with a big head and we pop him in the mouth. Does, does Rice ever have a big head? I think when they're playing in FCS school, they do. Uh, I I like I said is I think that's an interesting game. Um, I think the I think you're underestimating playing Incarnate Word there. Uh. I think the Southeastern game, I think McNeese actually wins the Southeastern game. I do agree with you there. I think the Nichols game is tough. I, I really think Nichols, I will probably project Nichols to win the league. Hmm. But I haven't done it yet. Um, I think Nichols is first. I think I think, I think, think McNeese finishes third. But I think uh, it's a third that uh, people will understand and accept. Yeah, it at the uh, beginning of uh don't you know, tell before, Gary Goff you want him to go nine and two. <laughs> you um you know, before going into the uh Southland Conference, you know, uh, press conference and all that, 
Like people were saying Southeastern was the favorite to win the league. And I'm like, did nobody get the memo that Cole, uh, Cole Kelly's gone? No. And, and there's, <laughs> he's not alone in being gone. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that when you look at the league a, a, in general and all the newcomers, and I, and I mean this, I don't think you can really tell who's going to be good. There is no question that McNeese with 15 transfer portal guys, especially a quarterback, can take the biggest leap. That I, I'll give you that. Uh, but I think if you watch them over the last four years really closely, you would know they have a lot of leaping to do because of a void of talent. Did they make up enough talent in one year? Can they learn? I, I think it's more about can they learn the system? How quickly? We'll know, we'll know opening day if they play. I'm not sure how they'll play up there, but if they can score some points in Montana, that's what I want to see. If their offense looks like it can move and score some points, this is going to be a fun year. Do you think uh, the ESPN Plus deal with the Southland Conference is going to hurt attendance at home games? Oh, it's not going to help it. Um, I've always been intrigued by McNeese fans when it comes to the tailgating and who stays out and just watches <laughs> the games on those things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think it kills it because I think it, it kind of promotes it on the road to make interest. Um, but it's more done for the road team. I don't, I don't, but I don't think it helps it any. I think the biggest thing that will will change this is winning games early and the seven o'clock start. Yeah, winning cures all. And remember, because we we talk about this and and all the and I always I always underline I, in the micro I always look at uh, the the quest for FBS. And Sam Houston won a national title in the spring, and came back and drew under eight thousand a game in the oh, fall. Wow. So it no longer forget that proverbial you got to draw fifteen thousand. McNeese draws thirteen thousand. They've blown away the rest of the Southland Conference, and they're ahead of all these other schools when it comes to that. So optically, they fit the package. Yeah. All right. Next up, this goes along with what we're going to talk about next. What is the hopeful timeline of moving to FBS, and is uh, Conference USA the goal? Well, if you talk to Heath Short, it was last summer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think realistically, it depends on what happens above. And I say that as in what happens with the Big Ten? How does that realignment work? How does everything fall into place? I think McNeese, honestly, with all the rebuilding that has to go on throughout the, the, score, the uh, press box and all the other things, I think three years would be great. Get yourself back into the national spotlight. Get your attendance back up. Get the town kind of rebuilt. I've been told by some Conference USA people that they're looking at two things. The economics of the city in the rebuild and the economics of the, of the school in the rebuild. The economics of the school's football program is going to be good. I, I can guarantee you that because I think that they've put into place this uh, McNeese Athletic Foundation thing. They're getting money. They will. I, I think they will eventually sell the naming rights to the stadium the way UL did. And that is an influx of, of lots of money that wasn't there before. Um, but I think that you have to look at what's going on above and where the openings come in. The reason why conference USA this year did not add people because they have three openings still essentially uh, was because they didn't want, they didn't want to split the exit money that had just left. In other words, if you're La tech, and you have six schools, and you're getting, I don't know, $20 million from the schools that just left, you'd rather split it six ways than eight, six ways than 10. So I think that was very temporary that they didn't do that. Uh, they will they will have to expand. Interestingly enough, the kind of dying Pac-12 opens up a lot of things that could mean the WAC dissolves. And, and becomes this weird Mountain West combination. I think there's also an opportunity for the Southland to do what uh, the Missouri Valley Conference did and make a monster FBS or FCS conference and do that down in the South and almost mirror the Big Ten SEC battle. Uh, maybe it's the Ohio Valley the Southland does a football agreement with. Maybe it's the Atlantic Sun. Uh, those opportunities are there, too. But I think FBS is is there for McNeese at the moment that everything kind of blows up again. 
or there <clears throat> any plans for the possible Southland Conference to move up to FBS? No, because it, it, it could do it in this way. A portion of the Southland Conference could do it. But the Co Southland Conference right now, as it exists, there's nobody that wants to move up besides McNeese mm. currently. Um, nor is there anybody that could. You have to look at, when you look at FBS, they're, they're looking at three things. They're looking at your financial situation, which means how you draw, your optics of what kind of facilities you have. What town are you in? Do you have enough hotels? Do you have an airport close enough to fly in and out of? That's another, that, those are things that they're also looking at. And thirdly, and maybe there's four, but thirdly, is there a travel partner for you? McNeese, if it went to the Sun Belt, UL would be a travel partner. Yeah, if Monroe left the Sun Belt, maybe McNeese would fly in. Um, or even more interestingly, are they a travel partner for Louisiana Tech in the Conference USA? Yeah, somewhat. That that would fit a package. Um, so that they have some things in place that nobody else has. Natchitoches doesn't have that. Lamar barely has it uh, and has no aspirations of playing FBS football. Um, I don't think Houston Baptist does, considering their parking lot is a CVS. Uh, <laughs> incarnate, incarnate word. Um, they were kind of told by the by uh, the Southland the first time they came in, you've got to improve your stadium seating, and they haven't. They're still at 6,000. Now, they're scary because they have Benson money attached to them, but mm -hmm. they haven't used it yet. Nichols and Southeastern are just now getting their feet kind of – standard in FCS. They're not going to move up. Plus, they'd be competing completely with both Tulane and LSU. Uh, no, I, I think McNeese is it, but McNeese could go in with former Southland teams like Sam Houston just went, Stephen F. Austin, uh, maybe with a, 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 a revitalized uh, uh, Tarleton State as a friend. So they're, they're, they're uh, I don't know, but I like to say realignment makes strange bedfellows. <laughs> yeah. Now you touched a little bit on the Sun Belt. Yeah. Obviously, when we hear about McNeese moving up to S FBS, usually Conference USA is the only conference that's mentioned. Yes. Um, is there a reason why the Sun Belt is kind of not in play? Yeah, it's no longer a uh, startup FBS. Ah. It has established itself. And, and that honestly is just a two or three year swing. That could come back down. Um, based on who you got. But if you look at pecking orders of conferences, it has become where people are pecking the Conference USA guys a lot, which is where the openings are. Sunbelt has kind of stabilized its people. Could it happen in the in the long run? Yeah. Once I said this 10 years ago, you're going to see this all blow up. You're going to see the Power 5 conferences and whatever numbers they finish with take their money and run. Because we're seeing it now with the new TV deals. It is absolutely impossible for me to believe you're going to charge the same amount of money for LSU to play Alabama for a ticket and play Alice and play McNeese. The ticket package isn't the same. The value isn't the same. So will LSU play those games anymore? Probably not. And then will ESPN or whoever has their deal buy it for that much? Probably not. So then you'll do away with those games and you'll have bigger. We'll go back to the days when Alabama played USC in the preseason. And those games, I think, will become TV games for revenue reasons. Now, how do you do then judge what, what makes up the F, what is now FCS, FBS minor? What makes up that group? Well, they get their money more from attendance. So, yeah, you could see McNeese playing UL because it, it's going to bring in a lot more fans for UL and for McNeese than, say, Houston Baptist does. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we'll eventually head into the tier of Power 5, Second 5, or whatever you want to call it, and then FCS. All right, we're now at the Q&A session. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. All right, let's see here. Is anybody listening? I think... They also, um, they give you an option that your name can appear on here, but I guess nobody chose that. Okay. What is the status of the press box? Will it be completed before the end of the season? No. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I think the press box comes down to how much the insurance and FEMA money ends up is what it looks like. I know what it wants to look like. Um, I know when they want to get started. I think my understanding is you'll have some type of financial decision on what they will afford and what they will get uh, come second week of the season, definitely by the home opener. Um, the reason for that is uh, if you if FEMA only pays for X number of dollars, it will look exactly the same. That's how FEMA and insurance money works. And we've all dealt with insurance money in this, so I feel bad for that. Uh, secondly is if they can get what they want, and and costs always go up every day, it seems, you're going to see a press box that is two levels that runs almost the length of that side, has a smaller press area, but a much larger suite area for fans with, I believe, at, at one of the versions, has kind of a uh, outdoor garden top deck. Oh, wow. But I think uh, before I give away too much, I think that will be disclosed as soon as they see the actual financial finish of what they're going to get. Yeah, I've seen the mock-up images of what they want it to look yeah. like. And if it does happen, that is going to be epic. Oh, it'll, be, it'll be great. It and, will uh, look it, beautiful. I might point out it will be a little better than sitting in the Cowboy Club and watching a game from an end zone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. We got another one right here. I believe there is a change in the culture of college football. I don't think players will ever commit to programs for a career like they used to. Players would be looking to portal for places to display their talents. Well, that's not a question. That's a statement that's accurate. <laughs> that's a 100% accurate statement. Uh, we are in the world of – we're in the first version of free agency in college sports. Uh, and I know fan, some fans don't like it. Um, some fa some coaches really don't like it, uh, but I tell the Nick Sabins of the world, quite frankly, you want to call yourself teachers. You're the ones that taught these kids this. You left Louis LSU for a better job and better opportunity. You left Miami to go to Alabama for a better opportunity. And I, I give the prime example of Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly was at Notre Dame. He was number five in the country. He had a chance to make the playoffs and he left Notre Dame for LSU for more money. And he believes a better chance to win the championship. So he did that for personal gain as a free agent. And I applaud him. That's the system we live in, but then don't tell kids, well, you've got to stay. We've created this system. Now I'd like to see the NCAA step up and say one transfer, you get one free shot. Uh, I don't like the, I'm going to go five schools in five years. Um, but until the NCA decides they're going to finally win a court case, uh, this is what we got. So you are a different football team every year as you are a basketball or anything else. Let's see is winning a F <clears throat> is winning an FCF championship, a goal before moving up to FBS. I think their goals are the same amount on the campus. Um, one does not preclude the other McNeese and, L UL in 2001, when UL went up, UL was one in 11. McNeese was playing for the national championship in Chattanooga. So it's not about winning for the FBS, but I think McNeese on the field is completely committed to getting back to the playoffs and trying to win a, a national championship, just like Sam Houston state did. And off the field, I think they're looking at the financial rewards that an FBS uh, bid would get them. And I think I, I think people that look at it as a sporting thing don't understand how much more money rolls into your campus athletic foundation when you go to FBS. Just the 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 game at Florida next year is a five hundred thousand dollar game for McNeese. That's what it's topped out as. That's all they can make at a, playing an FBS as an FCS. That same game gets them $2 million if they're an FBS school. Holy cow. Yeah. Not to mention, you lose you lose money when you win a national championship in FCS because you're not getting that TV money in that. You, you actually lose money. Whereas you don't go to a bowl game. You gain money because you share in what your conference makes. So that's 
It, it is, it is. How did Dr. McKell told me it is financially a way to save your athletic programs is to get to FBS. Right. Let's see. Who is the UL team? Uh, that would be USL for uh, University uh, of Slow Learners. Lafayette, if you want. Um, I can't say that because I'm on the radio in Lafayette. They want to uh, be called Louisiana. Just they Louisiana. do. And I, I call them the University of Louisiana at Lafayette when I write. Um, um, but on the radio, I have to call them the University of Louisiana. <laughs> yeah, much to their chagrin when they see uh, the Lafayette. They're on not there. the University of Louisiana. They, they're uh, be what you want to be. Uh, you know, doesn't make them any better or any worse on the field. Do you know if the CUSA actually offered McNeese to join, or was it just dialogue? Do we know about their interest? Uh, yeah, they never got an offer. If they got an offer, they would have jumped. Uh, um, they were, but they were close to getting an offer. I can tell you that there were there were votes going in that had and packages that had McNeese in uh, that had Stephen F. Austin in. Um, at the end of the day, I think the reality came in that they wanted to keep as much money as they could, but there is no question they are on the FCS shortlist to look at or the conference USA shortlist to look at. I've heard that from multiple people, both at McNeese and at conference USA. Oh, oh same question. Yeah. What is the status of the baseball facility repairs? Yeah. We're going baseball. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had been told that um, they are going to start with the overhang and the press box soon. Uh, I think that funding is actually a little ahead of the press box. Um, I think they want to have it all written and, and done when they host the tournament next year. And I think, I think it's essential that they do because part of this, part of getting the tournaments and all that was kind of to put pressure on some people in the town to get things fixed so that we optically look good on national TV. All right, got a comment real quick. Enjoying the show. Thank you, fellas. Oh, thank you. All right, let's see here. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier. How is the O-line looking? Bigger uh, in two ways. They have massively hit the weight room. But remember, this is a group of guys that didn't have an offseason. And when they had an offseason, it was COVID-related and they weren't on campus. So they were lifting weights in their home. Now, some people probably did very well at that. Some people didn't. But it got a lot bigger, uh, a lot stronger, and they brought in a lot of people. He went massively big, uh, both freshmen and in the portal and transfers to improve his offensive line. That They knew that was number one. That and getting a quarterback was one and one a with everybody talking. But he does always joke about um, – all he ever heard about was get a good quarterback, get a good kicker. <laughs> he see, he told me once he's never heard so much talk about a kicker before in his life. <laughs> You're dang right he did. All right, for people who are living in Houston, what's the best way to get tickets to the Rice game in the McNeese section? Um, I think you could still go through McNeese either. I would call McNeese. I think they go on sale August 8th. Uh and there is a se I don't know the section, but there is a McNeese section. I thought it was 135, which is going to have their sales in. Um, but if you want to sit with the McNeese people and guarantee that, you got to go through McNeese, which is I think you can do online. But I would call their office, but I think they go on sale Monday. Those go on sale Monday. Awesome. Well, Mr. Uh, Gazzolo. Yes. Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was gonna say just I, I think it's I do think it's 135 is the section, but I'm not sure on that. Yeah. Magnesia gets you in the right section. Yeah. <laughs> 135 or I don't think it's a I don't think it's gonna be a sellout. So well, hey, you never know. How many people can fit in uh where Rice plays? You know? I I don't know. I used I, I was always intrigued to know that that held a Super Bowl once. Really? So it's gotta be, yeah. It held it held Super Bowl for um the Chiefs and the Vikings. So it, it has to have it has to be fifty six thousand. Yeah. I thought that was the limit, but I don't know what the limit was in 1970. But yeah, I, I, it's a big stadium. I think you, I think you could see a game very similar to South Florida in that game. Awesome. Well, Mr. Gazzolo, thank you for your time, man. I know you were extremely busy. We appreciate you coming on the group and giving your knowledge as a McNeese insider. Make sure you join him tomorrow morning. 
You're going to be on the main. Uh. 6 a.m. Be there or be square. Get your coffee ready. And get ready for an awesome show. Uh, well, let's see. You. Another comment. This brings being a Pokes fan to a new level, guys. All right. Yeah. So this isn't the is that level. Is that level high or low? <laughs> <laughs> we got multiple guests lined up for the next few weeks. So we'll be putting that out a little bit later. So we're bringing lots of content to this group. Mr. Gazzolo, the triple threat. We uh, appreciate you as always. Where can people find you on? Do you do a lot of work on Twitter? Uh, I don't really. <laughs> uh, I get hammered on Twitter quite a bit. I do put stuff on Twitter when I, when I write stuff, but I, uh, I like to, I have a forum, so I like to let other people have forums, but I do put stories on there. So you can read the stories there. Um, but I, I've got a radio place. I've got a TV place. I have enough places. People don't need to know that much about me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is much appreciated. Thanks. Well, thank you. I, I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having you on back when the season gets started All and, right. uh, and have a good night's sleep. And, uh, be safe when you're driving to Lafayette tomorrow. Yeah, 4.30 comes early. Oh, Lord. Yes, <laughs> it does. All, All right. right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.